Although supersonic jet fighters and stealth aircraft are taken for granted as part of modern life, the sight of these incredibly high-tech flying machines still provides an impressive and startling sight as they pass overhead. By comparison, to see an old-fashioned wooden biplane bumbling along at a top speed of 91 miles an hour illustrates just how far aviation has come in just over a century. The FE-2B aeroplane in this footage was Britain's first attempt at a two-seat fighter and reconnaissance plane. It was used in 1915 on the Western Front of World War I. The push propeller design allowed a gunner or observer to sit with an unencumbered view but in a vulnerable seat at the front while the pilot sat immediately behind. Flying these planes could be thrilling yet scary. Take this report of Daring Do from the Calgary Daily Herald in Canada, reported by Lieutenant Observer J.P. Harvey, who was in the front seat of one of these biplanes, on his way home from a sortie. I had a fight with two German aeroplanes when a shell burst very close to us and I heard a large piece whiz past my head. Then the aeroplane started to come down head first, spinning all the time. We must have dropped about 5,000 feet in about 20 seconds. I looked round and saw the poor pilot with a terrible wound in his head. He was dead. I saw the only chance of saving my life was to step over into his seat, sit on his lap where I could reach his controls, and I managed to get the machine out of that terrible death plunge switched off the engine and made a good landing. We were 10,000 feet up when the pilot was killed and luckily it was this tremendous height that gave me the time to think and act. It's likely that Lieutenant Harvey of the Canadian Engineers was a volunteer. The newspaper avoided giving the name of his dead pilot but we know who this was. Second Lieutenant Claude Kelway Bamber seen here was only 20 when he died. Having joined the army in August 1914, he trained as a pilot with the Royal Flying Corps and his entire military career lasted just 15 months. Since his mother didn't want to believe this tragedy had occurred, she tried, through a psychic medium, to see if he might have survived somehow. And yes, through a Mrs Britton, Claude informed his mother of his survival on the other side. Claude's mother was shocked to have Mrs Britton describe her son as wearing a suit and not his uniform. But Claude said through Mrs Britton that he'd wanted to prove that he'd been with his mother only that afternoon when she'd been sorting through his suits to find one to give a friend in need. Subsequently, through numerous sittings with another medium, Mrs Gladys Osborne Leonard and her spirit guide feeder, much more was revealed by Claude to his mother, even though some aspects of the spirit world are beyond the capacity of human vocabulary to convey. Claude never expected the spirit dimension to exist and told what life was really like there and his Mother kept impeccable records which resulted in two books being published using his words. The first was Claude's book published in 1918 and the sequel was Claude's second book published in 1920. In these Claude described the conditions and his feelings of what happened to him. Until her son was killed Mrs Kelway Bamber was completely sceptical about the possibility of communication with the so-called dead and only through her deep grief did she decide to investigate. Claude's messages were received over a period of two years through Feeder, Mrs Osborne Leonard's spirit guide. And Claude's book, if you want to see it, is available on the website Ghost Circle as a free PDF for download. A good alternative is Michael Tim's excellent book, Dead Men Talking, which summarises several reports from soldiers killed in the First World War who reported back from the afterlife, including Claude. So what did Claude tell us about it? Strange things, such as that his spirit body was a replica of and as solid as his physical one left on Earth, 
even down to the wart on his finger, he reported. And this was particularly significant for his mother, since she had suggested when he was alive on earth that he should ask a doctor to remove it for him. Initially, Mrs. Kelway Bamber prevented the medium describing the details of her son's death because it would be so upsetting. And we would not know how this happened without his colleague's report in the Calgary newspaper. Claude reported that he woke up, maybe a fortnight later, in a hospital, thinking he was still on earth. When told he died, he couldn't believe it and assumed that he was dreaming. But finally he did get it. Only then did his mind fill with well-being and the prospect of adventure in what amounted to a new country. Here are some of the tenets of Claude's books. To those familiar with reports about the afterlife, described by other so-called dead people, Claude's statements will come as no surprise. He said he was living on the third plane that some people call Summerland. He declared he had the same personality as on Earth. He learnt that every person has to earn their own salvation. He explained that if he concentrated his will, his body would take him anywhere with the speed of thought. He said he and hundreds of other men killed in the war would go down to the battlefields to help bring away the souls of those passing out of their bodies. He reported he was training to be a teacher. And he assured his mother that only very ignorant people say things are impossible because they're beyond their understanding. Claude used his book to try describing man's connection with Christ and God and claimed that if God denied our free will, people would no longer be free agents but automatons. He described God as neither vengeful nor jealous and not even a personal God or a glorified mortal sitting on a golden throne. Well, let's take a look now at those pilots who flew across the Atlantic non-stop before anyone else. Given the enormous hoo-ha surrounding the American Charles Lindbergh, you may be surprised who managed it first, and it wasn't him. With the end of World War I, there were plenty of spare planes about, and in 1919, two British pioneers, John Alcock and Arthur Brown, became the first aviators to fly non-stop from Newfoundland in a wartime Vickers Vimy biplane like this flying replica. Once they had crossed the pond, as it became known, Olcock and Brown crash-landed in an Irish bog because it had appeared from the air to be just a smooth field. But despite this, they won the £10,000 prize for this achievement. This prize had been on offer for several years unclaimed. And only seven years later, on May the 20th and 21st, 1927, did the American aviator Charles Lindbergh finally managed the first solo flight across the Atlantic. Long Island, May 20th, 1927. Lindbergh readies the spirit of St. Louis. 500 spectators have gathered to see him off. On board, he's packed five ham sandwiches to keep him going. At 7.52 a.m., he's off and after a few bounces aloft, just barely clearing telephone lines. He flew alone for 33 and a half hours in his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, a single-engined high-wing monoplane seen here. Flying from New York to Paris, Lindbergh won a $25,000 prize. His fame spread more widely than Alcock and Brown since Lindbergh received more publicity not least through a newsreel released to cinemas like the one you've just seen. His achievement was flying between two major cities, a distance of 3,600 miles, that's 5,800 kilometres. As the 1920s proceeded, 
Other pilots took up challenges with planes able to cover longer distances now that engines had become more reliable. Here are three names you may already know of pioneer aviators from the 1920s. Firstly, Bert Hinkler, eight months after Lindbergh's transatlantic flight, this Australian pilot made the first solo flight from England all the way to Australia in his open cockpit biplane, seen here, leaving England on the 7th of February 1928. Obsessed with flying since he was a little boy, Hinkler's record flight was completed in just over 15 days. Then there was the American Amelia Earhart, in 1928, she became the first female to cross the Atlantic by airplane, this time as a passenger, rather than as a pilot. Even so, this resulted in great celebrity for her. She was mad about flying. On the 5th of May 1930, England's Amy Johnson became the first woman to fly solo from England to Australia, 11,000 miles to Darwin, in her biplane, a second-hand Havilland DH-60 Gypsy Moth named Jason. What did it feel like flying all alone to Australia? Well, I think it was rather pleasant flying alone. You see, there's certainly nobody to quarrel with or to contradict you. Nobody to say yes if you say no. Oh, I think it's good fun flying alone. Then, in 1932, five years to the day after Lindbergh's transatlantic adventure, Amelia Earhart became the first woman pilot to achieve a solo, non-stop transatlantic flight in her Lockheed Vega 5B. But because of strong north winds, icy conditions and mechanical problems, she was forced to land early near Londonderry in Ireland. Now sadly, all three of these pilots died in air accidents. In January 1933, Hinkler died during another attempt to fly solo from England to Australia and his body was discovered only four months later, lying beside his wrecked plane in the Italian mountains. During World War II, Amy Johnson served in the RAF's Air Transport Auxiliary that ferried aircraft from factories to RAF units all over the United Kingdom. She died on the 5th of January 1941, when her airspeed Oxford aeroplane, completely off course, mysteriously plunged into the icy cold Thames estuary near Hearn Bay in Kent, her body disappearing forever. Johnson's parachute was seen coming down by crew of the HMS Hazelmere, which set out to rescue her. She was unable to reach lines thrown to her, and she disappeared beneath the ship. And then there was Amelia Earhart, during her round-the-world attempt from west to east in 1937, she disappeared near tiny Howland Island in the Pacific Ocean, being unable to find the island in bad weather or land there. After 22,000 miles in her twin-engine Lockheed Electra plane, and with only 7,000 miles still to go, her tragic loss received worldwide attention, with numerous conflicting theories still circulating today, about what exactly happened to her. Now, it would be unrealistic of me to suggest that all three of these pilots, once dead, communicated from the other side through mediums. For the most part, people simply don't do that. Nothing more was ever heard from Bert Hinkler. No afterlife communication ever came from Amelia Earhart, or we'd know how she died. But Charles Lindbergh is more interesting. Though excessively tired, sitting in his cold cockpit, Lindbergh increasingly felt he was not alone in his plane. In his book, The Spirit of St. Louis, he reports, Without turning my head, I see them as clearly as though in my normal field of vision. These phantoms speak with human voices, friendly, vapour-like shapes, without substance, able to vanish or appear at will to pass in and out through the walls of the fuselage, as though there were no walls there. First one, and then another, presses forward to my shoulder to speak above the engine's noise, and then draws back among the group behind. At times, voices come out of the air itself, conversing and advising on my flight, discussing problems of my navigation, reassuring me, 
giving me messages of importance unattainable in ordinary life. Lindbergh reckoned these spirit voices helped him stay awake, but was this just a case of sleep deprivation or something different? Eventually, after flying as low as 10 feet above the sea, Lindbergh located Le Bourget airfield in Paris, with people estimated at anywhere between 30,000 and 150,000 flocking to greet him. Now, when I was an amateur sailor many years ago, I read the famous book Sailing Alone Around the World by Captain Joshua Slocum, who was born in 1844 and died in 1909. In his refurbished wooden boat, Spray, seen here, he was the first person to single-handedly complete a circumnavigation of the globe. He was Nova Scotia born and a naturalised American who, in 1900, wrote about his almost three-year journey of 46,000 miles before then disappearing for good in 1909 aboard his boat while heading for the West Indies on one of his usual winter voyages. His book became an international bestseller and is available online as a free PDF document. If you turn to page 18, Slocum reports feasting on plums and cheese that he'd picked up in the Azores Islands in mid-Atlantic. These made him sick with a stomachache and a high temperature that forced him to lie down on the cabin floor, leaving the boat to steer itself. And then he continues, when I came to, I realised that the sloop was plunging in a heavy sea, and looking out of the companionway, to my amazement, I saw a tall man at the helm. His rigid hand, grasping the spokes of the wheel, held them as in a vice. One may imagine my astonishment. His rig was that of a foreign sailor, and the large red cap he wore was cockbilled over his left ear, and all was set off with shaggy black whiskers. He would have been taken for a pirate in any part of the world. While I gazed upon this threatening aspect, I forgot the storm and wondered if he'd come to cut my throat. This he seemed to divine. Senor, he said, doffing his cap, I have come to do you no harm. And a smile, the faintest in the world, but still a smile, played on his face, which seemed not unkind when he spoke. I have come to do you no harm. I have sailed free, he said, but was never worse than a contrabandista. I am one of Columbus's crew, he continued. I am the pilot of the Pinta, come to aid you. Lie quiet, senor, captain, he added. You did wrong to mix cheese with plums. White cheese is never safe unless you know whence it comes. I will guide your ship tonight. You have a calentura, but you will be all right tomorrow. Now, this episode is not unlike Lindbergh's spirits coming to help. The question is, did these men simply hallucinate, or is there a more spiritual interpretation? To come to your own conclusion, you'll need more information than I've given here. But before I proceed to Amy Johnson's post-mortem communication, I must deviate, as I've just done with Joshua Slocum, this is Leslie Flint, one of the most famous direct voice mediums ever. His reputation is defended and promoted by the Leslie Flint Trust website. Born in London in 1911, he had little education, becoming in turn a cemetery gardener and grave digger, a cinema usher and a barman. But despite this humble background, he received widespread recognition for his gift while remaining a modest man. He was never caught in fraud. But since there will always be sceptics, there will always be critics. Examples from online reviewers include Flint sounds like a lousy medium at best, and most likely a stage show fraud. Another argues, time to call the Flint mediumship for what it is, bunk, perpetuated on people too willing to be easily duped. But if such critics had perhaps read Flint's autobiography, they might have reached different conclusions. In this book, Flint reports seeing spirits from the age of seven, and he held his first seance while still a teenager. 
Later, his sitters reported hearing voices of so-called dead people surrounding them in the room. And to prove his phenomena were genuine, he went to extraordinary lengths in allowing investigators to study him. Flint himself wrote, I think I can safely say I am the most tested medium this country has ever produced. I've been boxed up, tied up, sealed up, gagged, bound and held, and still the voices have come to speak their message of life eternal. And to show he was not a ventriloquist, he was made to hold coloured water in his mouth to prevent him speaking, yet even then the voices still occurred. Then he returned this coloured water to the glass. My gift is independent direct voice mediumship, he explained. I stay awake and do not speak in trance. The spirit voices are located in a space a little above my head and slightly to one side of me, and they speak directly to their friends and relatives. Indeed, thanks to Professor Bennett of Columbia University, there's an infrared photograph of Flint shot in the dark during a seance that shows ectoplasm emanating from the medium to form the etheric voice box or mask that spirit communicators need to produce their messages. And very many spirits complained about this complicated and difficult procedure for converting their thoughts into voices. From the mid-1930s and for 30 years, Flint's mediumship took off. This photograph shows a meeting of 2,000 people that took place in London's Kingsway Hall, and there were many such meetings held all around the country. Not only did his seances allow sitters to contact deceased friends, famous people also came through Flint seances to converse from the other side. His spirit guide and the master of ceremonies during these seances was a child, John Whitehead, who called himself Mickey. This is a spirit drawing of the lad that I personally dislike. During his lifetime, Mickey was a newspaper seller in Camden Town, London, before being hit and killed in 1910 by a lorry. Sometimes the voices at Flint seances were very weak, and if they petered out through, say, obvious emotion, Mickey would stand in for the spirit to finish their messages for them. In 1955, with Leslie's agreement, two researchers, Betty Green and George Woods, seen here, began making tape recordings of Flint seances, collecting hundreds of voices over many years. The shame of it was the less than professional quality of their equipment and lack of expertise in using it to best advantage. This resulted in numerous faint or distorted recordings. Nonetheless, they remain the best direct voice phenomena that we can listen to. They're now housed at the University of Manitoba in Canada, but you don't need to go to Manitoba to hear this material. Examples are available on YouTube, with more on the Leslie Flint Trust website. They include such people as George Bernard Shaw, Winston Churchill, Elizabeth Fry, Mahatma Gandhi, Rupert Brooke, Queen Alexandra, Queen Victoria and her servant John Brown, and Judge Lord Birkenhead, the former Lord Chancellor. Other recordings include Sir Oliver Lodge, Frederick Chopin, the moon landing astronaut John Grant, Rudolf Valentino, the star of silent movies, Charles Dickens, George Hopkins, a farmer, Cosmo Lang, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, as well as Amy Johnson, the flyer we'll be looking at shortly. Nonetheless, critics think they know better. This one saying, Mickey's voice alone tells me Flint is a fraud. He's a horrible ventriloquist. Mickey sounds exactly like a grown man trying to sound like a young boy. Well, is that true? Here are two examples of the original recordings to demonstrate the variety of the voices. The first one is a recording of Anne, who had died in 1966, talking with her husband, Dr. Nanji, a biochemistry professor. For 13 years, he visited Leslie Flint twice a year in order to chat with his deceased wife. This example shows that she had spotted that he had already added his own name to her gravestone 
without, of course, adding his date of death, which had yet to happen. You are very funny. Yeah. I have to laugh at you. Yeah. You have, uh, on the gravestone, yes, you know. have got my name and because date, and now you have got your name, but no date. No date. Yes. Because you don't know when you're coming. Yeah, exactly. But you will be able to put, have the date put in when you are yes. here. Yes, that's right. You will make arrangements for yes, you. There is room for yes. you. There. Because but you won't be there. You will be with me. But it seems so strange that you should have already arranged to put your name on the stone when you are not there yet. Often the conversations between them were trivial about his apartment, his clothing and where he goes for dinner. She obviously kept an eye on him from the other side. This second example comes from the deceased Dr Charles Marshall who was asked about the possibility of spirits going to the lower spheres on a visit to help people stuck there. I'm a bit surprised by this voice. We're told by people from the other side that you adopt a younger body once you're over there. And yet this voice sounds like the voice of an old man. In regard to entering into the lower spheres, you do need a certain amount of education, uh, the method of approach, for instance. You just can't go like a bull into a china shop into one of the lower spheres. Believe me, it could be dangerous. Even for a highly evolved soul. Even for one who has progressed to a certain degree. If you think these two voices came from one ventriloquist, allow me to disagree. One is distinctly feminine and the other masculine. However, other recordings may not be so easily understood given their poor quality. So instead, some YouTube productions have living people read the transcript for the sake of clarity. I've done it myself. Having said that, though, some of the celebrities do have voices recognisably like their own when alive. And this inconsistency has provided sceptics with ammunition for criticism. Leslie Flint himself had little time for such people. He says... When I first began to allow myself to be tested, I was naive enough to believe that if the tests were successful, the scientists and researchers who'd carried them out would proclaim to the world the truth of life after death. All too soon, I learned the hard way that many of those who call themselves researchers have immutable values of their own which preclude belief in meaning or purpose in man's existence or in the possibility of life after death. Their concern was to disprove the reality of my voices and they would postulate any alternative, however far-fetched or absurd, sooner than admit the implication of their own successful experiments. In his autobiography, Voices in the Dark, Flint says, I've learned more about life, people and human problems and emotions by sitting in the dark than I could possibly have learnt in any other way. Those who have taught me the most are people dead to this world. So now let's return to the pilot Amy Johnson, who recorded her views through Leslie Flint 29 years after her death in January 1970. For the sake of clarity, this short sample is a voiced piece from the popular YouTube channel Weird World, instead of being Amy's own voice. I'm not terribly in touch with your world now. Occasionally, just now and again, I hear from various people things that are happening and certainly the world doesn't seem to improve in some respects, does it? If only people did understand more about this business of dying and life after death and the kind of world to some extent that they will find. I mean, I just think it's dreadful. I think it's awful to think that people don't understand this. I mean, when I first came over here, it was a great shock. Time is most peculiar with us. We're not subject to it anymore. Time, space, distance, so many things that apply on Earth don't seem to have the same meaning here. There is a form of time, I suppose, but it's not measured by the sun and the moon, stars and the calendar. I've got all sorts of interests. I've lost interest in flying, which I suppose to some people must sound very strange, but of course, one doesn't need to. Anyway, one doesn't need mechanical things here. It's not necessary anymore. Amy went on to mention her current interest was in educating and encouraging children. 
Now, changing topics, you may already have realised that pioneering aviators attempting long-distance records were flying from west to east across the Atlantic. That's to say, with the wind and not against it. But Elsie Mackay wanted to be the first woman to fly from east to west. In fact, Elsie had two names. Her stage name was Poppy Wyndham, a flamboyant actress in eight silent movies between 1919 and 1922. As the daughter of an earl, Lord Inchcape, the p shipping tycoon, she was also known as the Honourable Elsie Mackay, a glamorous member of British high society. In addition to her acting, Elsie also helped design the interiors of her father's ocean liners. She was also a jockey, and my guess is a very spoiled child. Flying was another passion of hers, since she loved the mix of speed and danger it involved. Our next character, Captain Walter Raymond Hinchcliffe, born in 1893, was also known as Hinch. A talented man, he was best known as a flying ace in World War I, which earned him the Distinguished Flying Cross. He downed numerous enemy planes, but in one sortie was shot through the forehead and crashed his plane, resulting in severe facial injuries. Blinded in his left eye, he wore a patch over it for the rest of his life. It was his peerless reputation that made Hinchcliffe a natural choice for pilot when Elsie Mackay planned to fly the wrong way across the Atlantic. Her plane was a Stinson Detroiter, a modest American monoplane for passengers or freight, with a maximum speed of 134 miles an hour and a rather lower cruising speed. In March 1928, the Daily Express newspaper discovered Hinch and Elsie's preparations for a flight taking off from RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire, but this story was suppressed by Elsie's threat of legal action. Her intention was to depart in secret while her father was in Egypt, having previously promised that she would not make the attempt. It was a decision that would cost her her life. At 8.35am on the 13th of March 1928, Endeavour lumbered into the air heavily laden with fuel, and five hours later a lighthouse keeper on the coast of Cork in Ireland witnessed the plane heading for Newfoundland. A crowd of 5,000 people gathered to welcome the heroes, but they never arrived. Hinchcliffe's treacherous flight with Elsie had failed. Like Lindbergh, the plane carried no radio. But precisely what had happened? On the night of the flight, a Colonel Henderson, one of Hinchcliffe's wartime friends, was aboard a P&O liner in the South Atlantic, and he witnessed what he claimed was a solid apparition. Hinch was just in my cabin, he told his friend. Eye patch and all. He kept repeating, Hendy, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I've got this woman with me and I'm lost. These friends aboard the ship did not even know about the flight. But three days later, the news did indeed come through, confirming that the plane was lost. There was an amateur medium involved in this story too. Beatrice Earl, that's a pseudonym by the way, was accustomed to using a Ouija board occasionally to communicate with her son who died in World War I, when one day she received an unexpected message that said, I was drowned with Elsie Mackay. It was Hinchcliffe requesting Beatrice to contact his wife. A few days later he came again, this time with the address of his solicitors. Apply Drummond, High Street, Croydon, it said. However, Beatrice, being convinced Emily Hinchcliffe would not believe her story, contacted instead Arthur Conan Doyle to act as an intermediary with Mrs Hinchcliffe, which he agreed to do. Subsequently, Mrs Hinchcliffe met with this amateur medium and also sat with the famous medium Eileen Garrett to witness her husband providing the following information. I've abbreviated it. It said, Left Cranwell, 8.35. Our spirits were high. It was not until 10pm that we met bad weather. The gale became so bad that at midnight I decided to change my course to get out of gale 
and went straight south. Gale broke left strut and right strut cracked, fabric torn. At 1am we knew it would be impossible to get across, decided to make for the Azores, but from 1am on I knew everything was finished. He became unconscious. I flew due south until 3am trying to find Azores, but had to come down on water at 3.10am within sight of an island. I left machine and tried to swim to land, but failed. Through this post-mortem message, Emily became convinced her husband had reached the Azores, although the evidence of an undercarriage wheel arriving in Northwest Ireland nine months later brought that into question. Nonetheless, based on her contact with the mediums, Emily wrote a book, The Return of Captain Hinchcliffe, published in 1930. This book is virtually unobtainable. The bad news was that although Elsie had agreed to provide life insurance for her pilot, the cheque to pay for it had not cleared. So Emily and her young daughters were left potentially penniless. However, after legal wrangling and public pressure through the newspapers, and with support from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Lord Inchcape finally came up with £10,000 for them in place of the insurance his daughter had promised. So now, let's turn to the Second World War and the Battle of Britain, which began on the 10th of July until the 31st of October 1940. It took place largely over Kent in the southeastern corner of England, between the relatively small RAF and Germany's huge fleet of fighter aircraft and bombers as they tried to achieve air supremacy in readiness for Hitler's planned invasion of Britain. The leader of Fighter Command and the mastermind behind its strategy was Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding, seen here. He surprised the Luftwaffe by already having established a radar system for locating incoming aircraft at a range of 80 miles and therefore giving fair warning to his pilots on when to scramble their planes in defence. Since 1936, he'd been preparing for just this type of conflict. In addition to his effective leadership, Dowding was also a spiritualist and a speaker on the evidence for survival after death. He saw his role as supporting his men, getting them the best equipment available to continue the fight, including hurricane fighters, spitfires and radar and he also offered support to families whose sons were killed in action. His first book on the subject was Many Mansions, published in 1943, followed by Lichgate, 1945, and then The Dark Star, published in 1951, and finally God's Magic, published in 1960. He was neither a conventional Christian nor a sentimentalist, preferring to confront hard facts. He examined cases soberly and critically, presenting evidence for life after death. As it happens, Lord Dowding knew Leslie Flint and attended some of his seances. Take this example of one where the parents of Flight Lieutenant Peter Kite came for a sitting. They had no experience of psychic matters and before their son communicated, they were addressed by the deceased Arthur Conan Doyle, who explained how their son's plane had crashed, yet that he still found himself alive in a new body that resembled his deceased one. This lay motionless within the plane wreckage and which Peter Kite could see. However, his bewilderment was resolved when some of his friends, already deceased, arrived to take him to his new life. When finally Peter greeted his parents, he announced excitedly, I've got the dog mother, it's an Alsatian. This referred to a joke that he'd played on her only a few days before he died. He'd announced he was sending her a dog, knowing she would be appalled to have a boisterous Alsatian in the house that might wreck it. After this teasing, he reminded her it was April Fool's Day. He stated that he also noticed seeing her put his photograph in her handbag along with ones from Norway, just before she left home for the seance. And Mrs Kite admitted that she had indeed just changed handbags and transferred the contents from one to the other, including his photograph 
and another showing her son's burial site in Norway. Peter commended his parents on the memorial garden that they'd made for him at the rear of their home. He noted that in the years since his death, they had altered nothing in his former bedroom. And he suggested to his dad that he was rather a tight fit for Peter's little sports car that his father was now driving. He ended with, I'm saying all these silly things so you know it's really me speaking. And he assured them, I'm more alive now than I ever was. It was experiences of sittings like this that contributed to Sir Hugh Dowding's spiritualism. He died in 1970 and this is the memorial tablet in Westminster Abbey where his ashes are buried. It acknowledges his successful leadership despite the RAF being outnumbered by Germany. And incidentally, not all the Battle of Britain pilots were British. Poland's air force had survived just three days after Hitler's invasion of their country and after the further collapse of France by the end of July 1940 a total of 8,384 Polish airmen had made it to Britain to continue the fight with a brave contingent of pilots making an enormous contribution to the final outcome. So Sir Hugh Dowding admitted that but for their magnificent effort and unsurpassed gallantry, the battle might not have ended in success. Indeed, Polish Squadron 303 became the highest scoring unit in the battle. In a single sortie, they shot down 14 enemy planes and four probables. And of the 145 Polish pilots who took part in the battle, 31 died in action. Of course, like any other people, a few of them were even able to communicate after their death. Here is a much abbreviated version of remarks by a dead Polish pilot we'll call SZ. This testimony comes from Lord Dowding's book Many Mansions. Yes, I am shot down and out. I have survived many flights, but not this one. I was astounded. I do not know where I am. I forget I have no faith in religion, and yet I pray for help and it comes to me. Someone looking very strange and yet quite like ourselves comes to me and he says, do not mind the change, it is best for all and that I shall be happy in this land. I am very confused. I think I am taken prisoner. Then he explains, there are no prisons or prisoners here. He touched my eyes and I sleep at once. When I wake, he's still there and I am on earth again, in the occupied territory with Germans all around. I have come back to my body, yet I'm in two worlds. All the things I made fun of come back to me. I was a bad man. I had neglected many things, my prayers and my church, but I do not know if that mattered. I have no creed, and now I find that extinction being impossible I have to suffer a sort of conscious extinction, knowing and feeling, yet being empty of strength. What you expect here, that you find. You build your awakening, it is just as you imagined, at least that is what they told me. I expected nothing, so nothing came. But now I am pulling out of the difficult doldrums and beginning to feel my strength. It was evidence like this, and Peter Kite's evidence, that made Hugh Dowding a spiritualist. Being no medium himself, he just collected the evidence. One strange case involved Jack Maxwell Whiting, missing in action in 1944 and presumed dead. Max was Muriel Whiting's husband, and she was particularly upset by the word presumed. It was so indefinite opening the chance that Max was captured and alive. So she consulted a medium for more definite information. Going anonymously to the College of Psychic Science in London, as soon as she entered the room of Miss Topcott, a medium, she was told that Max, her brother, was there, which was quickly corrected to your husband. You do know he's on the other side? Miss Topcott asked. Apparently, Max died when his Lancaster bomber was shot down by German fighter planes over Denmark as he was on his way to Norway. 
but this was not officially confirmed until two years after the war had ended. For Muriel, this was confusing, as she'd understood this final mission was really aimed at Duisburg in Germany. So wanting clarification, she wrote to Lord Dowding for assistance in finding the truth. Where had he really gone? This letter brought the two into contact with each other, and they had lunch together, which ultimately led to their marriage. They had in common an interest in psychical issues, as shown here by her autobiography. As Lady Dowding, she asked her husband, why he had even bothered to respond to her letter directly himself, inviting her out to lunch, when he was surely far too busy with demands on all sides. In reply, Lord Dowding explained that on one of his visits to a medium, Max came through, identifying himself and saying, I wish you would take my wife out to lunch. You will like her. And the rest is history. Of course, not all evidence for survival depends on Lord Dowding. Take this case of a worried mother, Lady Maclean, whose son Ian was reported missing shot down in 1943. Since she knew a Miss Gibbs, who shared a home with the famous medium Geraldine Cummins, Lady Maclean asked Miss Gibbs to discover if her son had really been killed or, as she suspected, was still alive. So through Geraldine Cummins, Miss Gibbs turned for help to her deceased nephew. What follows is Nigel's reply through Miss Cummins' automatic writing, which I've abbreviated as follows. Nigel Gibbs here. Yes, tell my aunt I've talked to McLean. He had to have a long rest as he passed through his body so suddenly. He simply slept and dreamt while his etheric body gradually emerged from the chrysalis. That's how we explain it here. He has no recollection of agonising pain, only for one awful searing moment, a blaze of light, and then the tunnel. I asked him about his life in this corner of our immense world. It's not like the earth as far as I know. No boundaries. Anyway, McLean said he was having an amazing time. He'd found his own crowd and they were neither in heaven nor in hell nor any other hotspot but were in a perfectly normal world and leading a life packed with thrills. He said if it wasn't for those left behind he'd have no regrets but he's worried about his family's financial affairs and whether there's enough to make things comfortable for them. He wants his mother not to be upset about him. He isn't lost or missing and was saved a lot of misery by taking the big jump into this world like a parachutist. No brakes and a clean landing. And there's nothing to be sad or worried about. Now, as we conclude, let's recall how many people we've met in this program. Anne Nanji and Dr Charles Marshall, both deceased yet communicating directly through Leslie Flint. And then the pilots, Lieutenant Claude Kelway Bamber, Amy Johnson, Captain Raymond Hinchcliffe, Lieutenant Peter Kite, Ian McLean, and the Polish pilot whose initials were SZ, as well as Lady Dowding's former husband, Max. Was all this just invention or made-up fantasy? I don't think so. There's no doubt dying is a great event in everyone's life. But we turn finally to Sir Oliver Lodge, a renowned physicist, the first principal of Birmingham University in England, the author of several spiritualist books, and another person who communicated directly from the afterlife through Leslie Flint. His perspective rather diminishes the significance of death into being just another step on the way to eternity. He says, and I quote, Few families have not been struck down by calamity during the years of the war, but I want to point out that this is not so serious a matter. It is transition a natural process of emancipation of the soul from the body, not extinction. The body is only a transitory thing of 70 or 80 years. We must be aware of this transitoriness of the body, unlike the permanence of the soul. And we must realise that character is a possession lasting throughout eternity. We only take ourselves with us to the next life, nothing else. 
there can be little doubt that if people's fear of death were to dissolve, it would potentially transform society. The afterlife evidence we've received through these seven aviators is an invitation to think of our demise as simply leaving behind our physical overcoats. An open-minded wonder about ultimate things surely does no harm and may be an immense good to those who indulge in it. Thanks for listening.